got now? Let's see, let me turn this on. <laughs> Muted. Muted. you got your Bibles tonight, turn with me to 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter of you tonight knew that you were in a battle before you came to church tonight? If you didn't know you were in a battle, I just want to inform you that you are in a battle. And whether you like it or not, you're on the battlefield. <laughs> and if you're with the Lord, you're on the battlefield for the Lord. Who are you fighting against? The enemy. You're taking territory from the devil. So tonight... I need you to know how to fight if you're on the battlefield. And the best way I know how to fight is with the weapons and armor that God gave you in the Bible, but also, most importantly, by faith. You Amen. fight with your faith and your trust in your God Amen. tonight. You don't fight in your own strength. You don't fight with your own weapons. You don't fight with your own intelligence. You fight the way God told you to fight. And sometimes that looks a lot like being on your knees and trusting the Lord and spending time in prayer and asking the Holy Spirit to move in a situation. But tonight we're on the battlefield for our Lord and our enemy is Satan. You know, we were practicing here on Monday night and we were trying to determine what to sing on Wednesday. And I said, well, I'm teaching on faith on Wednesday, so let's just talk about stuff that relates to faith. And as they turned through all their books and stuff, everything they brought up, they're like, no, nah, I don't want to do that. No, nah, I don't want to do that. And I said, what about I'm on the battlefield for my Lord? Because if you have faith in God, knowing that you're on the battlefield for your Lord and knowing that the Holy Spirit lives on the inside of you, I'm on the battlefield, but I'm more powerful than the enemy that I'm fighting right. because the Holy Amen. Spirit lives inside Amen. of me. So I was thinking, we got to know we're on the battlefield, but we also got to know what a mighty God that we serve. Right. Yeah. And as we were singing that second line that we do, I command you, Satan, in the name of the Lord, to take up your weapons and flee. For the Lord has given me authority. And they kept saying, singing, and I know many of you probably did too, to walk all over thee. When, when's the last time you cast out the enemy with a thee? I'm going to say you. I'm going to take you down, devil. You know, sometimes you got to fight him in American English and not King James. <laughs> sometimes you got to fight the devil. The only way you know how, and that's to say, devil, you get your butt behind me. For you are defeated tonight. But tonight we're going to start in 1 John chapter 5. But let's just go to the Lord in prayer before we get into these scriptures. Heavenly Father, Lord, we invite your presence here. We come before you boldly in the name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. We thank you, God, that you have ordained this day that we could be in your presence. We thank you today, God, that you have given us a warrior's heart and you put your Holy Spirit on the inside of us. And tonight I'm asking you to take your word and burn it within our hearts with passion and fire, God. I'm praying that you would stir up those dry bones if we be sitting stagnant in your river tonight. God, I pray that you would give us an unction to get in the stream and flow with you tonight. Holy Spirit, we're asking you for a new flow and for a fresh infilling and a fresh fire of your presence. We need you, God. Stir us up, Lord, unto you. Stir us up to good works that we may honor you and glorify you. And tonight, God, we ask you to bless your word. I pray that you would anoint me and help me to preach what you have me to preach tonight, Father. And give us ears to hear, Lord, what you might say. We welcome you, Holy Spirit. We invite you. Do what you want to do tonight, Holy Spirit. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 1 John chapter 5. It says in verse 1, Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. All right. 
Raise your hand if you believe that Jesus is the Christ. Amen. The Bible says if you believe that, you are born of God. And it says, and everyone that loves him that begat loves him also that is begotten of him. Let me read that in the Amplified. Everyone who believes, adheres to, trusts, and relies on the fact that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, is a born-again child of God. And everyone who loves the Father also loves the one born of him, his offspring. Verse 2 by this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and keep His commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments. Man, that looks a lot different than what many times we're taught. Loving God is just accepting people the way they are. No, it's not. Loving God is to keep God's commandments. Amen. And when you keep God's commandments, sometimes you have to say to people, you're not right with God. Right. Don't judge me. No, no, your life shows me you're not right with God. The fruit of your life shows me right. that. Sometimes God convicts me and says, Lucas, your actions aren't right with me. You need to repent and get that under the blood and change the way you're doing things. But it says... If you love God, you will keep his commandments. And look at this part. This probably applies to every one of us at some point in our lives. And his commandments are not grievous or not burdensome, not oppressive. So we're not only supposed to keep the commandments of God, we're supposed to keep them with joy and being happy about it. So we raised our hands saying we were born again. Raise your hand if you've ever felt restricted by the commandments of God. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> but it says that when we keep his commandments, they shouldn't be oppressive and burdensome to us. When God gives us his will in a situation, we should rejoice and say, praise God, I get to do what God said. I get to go make it right with my brother that I'm offended with. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. <laughs> Dave, you remember that time you had to go to your boss yeah. and tell him that God gets your attention sometimes and does things in ways that you're like, oh, please don't make me do that. Well, you need to get up and do it because that's what's best for you. And what we live in is a, a mamby-pamby society that we just want to walk over everybody's feelings and just gloss them over and say, it's okay that you feel the way you feel. It's okay for you to act the way you act. No, it's not. The Bible says it's not. The Bible says that if you love God, you will pursue to do what God says. You know, Amber uh, was thinking about putting a, a thing that I said on Facebook and I thought it was clever. Some people might be offended by it. But I said, the Bible was written for Christians. That's why you don't read it. <laughs> Let that sink in. The Bible was written for Christians. So if you don't have any desire to read it, fill in the blank. <laughs> Let me start with number one. When I gave my heart to Jesus, I immediately had a desire to read the Bible. <clears throat> but it's because you're a preacher, Lucas. Partially, but not totally. Now, I believe preachers have a desire to get into work maybe more than regular people. But if you don't have a desire to know what God has to say, your roots might not be the roots you think they are. If you don't want to hear what God has to say about anything... Don't call yourself a Christian because you're doing a disservice to God. You can't say I respect God and refuse to listen to anything God has to say. Amen. You don't respect God if you don't want to hear what God has to say. Y'all didn't know I was going to be this mean on Wednesday night, did you? I say mean, but it's not mean. It's just telling the truth. And sometimes in our society, we've got away from telling the truth. You see... The scripture that I want to get to in 1 John chapter 5 
is verse 4. But after I read verse 1 through 3, I said, God, I've got to bring that out before we get to verse 4 because it's impactful. This is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. You all remember Balaam in the Old Testament, right? He's the one that that, that guy hired to try to curse Israel. Balaam was a prophet at that time, and a man hired him to try to get him to curse Israel so that they wouldn't come and overtake this guy's territory and land. And God told Balaam at first, I don't want you to go, Balaam. And the first thing that comes out of Balaam's mouth to this king is, God wouldn't let me do it. He won't let me come with you. He forbid me to go with you. That sounds an awful lot like the last half of verse 3. And his commandments are not grievous or burdensome or restricted. Balaam was restricted by the commandments of the Lord. He didn't delight to do what God said. And guess what? You keep on reading the narrative. Balaam ends up getting judged and killed. He ends up dying. You see... It's not enough just to say, I'm going to do my best to do what God says. You have to pursue a transformation in your heart. If you do not pursue being transformed on the inside, God's commandments will always be burdensome and restrictive to you. I know so many people over the years, and you do too, that they say, well, if I come to God, I can't do this anymore. I can't have fun anymore. I'm just going to be a fuddy-duddy if I come to God. You know how the world thinks about the church. You're missing the whole point. If you don't come to God, you're never going to experience the love that we experience from our Father. If you don't come to God, you'll never experience the presence of God that overwhelms you to where the biggest, toughest, strongest men fall on their face and cry because they're like, I'm overwhelmed by who God is. If you've never experienced the true presence of God, you are missing out. Right. Yeah. I've never felt anything better. I've never felt anything more powerful. I've never felt anything as strong as I have felt in the presence of God. Mm -hmm. The presence of God will make somebody that doesn't shout a shouter. The presence of God will make somebody that doesn't cry a crier. The presence of God will make someone who's afraid to dance in front of people a dancer. You see, the presence of God transforms you. Because when it gets on the inside of you, there's something within you that cannot be contained. So if you can be contained under his presence, you've got too comfortable in it. You've got too comfortable in your relationship with God. You've got too comfortable if you can have an encounter with the Most High God and it doesn't change your body posture in the least. You're too comfortable. You need to go back to the altar. You're too comfortable. If his presence doesn't move you, you're too comfortable. If church is always a burden to come to and you're never excited about going, you're too comfortable in your dysfunction. If church has become that, I, I look at how hard it is for churches that aren't entertaining churches <clears throat> to get people to come anymore. And when I say entertaining, I'm talking about smoke and Really loud music and bright lights and really cool style of dressing and really cool videos you can put up on the screen. And You know, last time I checked, Jesus didn't say go to church so you could be entertained. That's right. Amen. He said go to church so you could fellowship with your brothers and sisters, so you could have a relationship with each other, but so you could hear his word, so you could worship him. When I come to church, my eyes can't be on the preacher or the singers or someone else. My eyes have to be, God, I'm coming here because I'm ready to meet with you. Amen. And I see so many instances throughout the body of Christ where we don't like to come to church anymore because it's not what it used to be. God says you're not what you used to be. That's right. Amen. Don't blame the church. Blame your heart. It's like a block of wood. It's hard. Because Jonathan Edwards was able to preach this sermon called Sinners in the Hand of an Angry God. And he preached it in a monotone voice. And people were weeping everywhere. The content of the message 
is where the heart of the power is. It's not in the delivery. Because God's made some people fiery, shouting, spitting preachers. But he's made some people calm teachers. And I can guarantee you, Jesus wasn't always spitting and slobbering when he was talking. I can guarantee you the Apostle Paul was not always spitting and hollering when he was talking. The power of God is received in a humble heart that is receptive to say, God, I want to hear what you have to say no matter how it comes out and no matter who it comes through. I've learned that God can speak to me through Aaron and Eve. I've learned that God can speak to me through sinners that are lost. God is always talking to you. And if you don't hear him, it's because you're not listening anymore. You're not, you're not listening anymore. But it says in verse 4, this is where I'm wanting to get to tonight. For whatsoever is born of God overcomes the world. Whatsoever is born of God overcomes the world. Our pastor preached on Sunday morning. He was talking about the world and its system. There's a system and an agenda behind the world and the prince of the power of the air, the enemy that works in operation in the world. And there's a system in the world that tries to say, you are God, have it your way. You are God, whatever feels right is right. You are God, whatever you think is true is true. You can embrace your truth. There is but one way to heaven. There is but one truth. There is but one salvation. And it's Jesus Christ the Lord and Him crucified. And the Bible says that I am crucified with Christ. So that if I embrace a salvation that I never went to the cross and died with, I don't have salvation at all. If you are not crucified with Christ, you are lost in your sins. You are not saved if you have not been crucified with Christ because the very foundation of the gospel is that Jesus died on the cross and rose from the dead. If you'll join him, you can rise from the dead. Right. It says we died with him. But we live in a culture where you can be a Christian without changing. You cannot be a Christian if your life does not change. You say, but I prayed the prayer. The, the devil believes that Jesus is God too. But he's going to split hell wide open. It's not enough to just say, I know Jesus is Lord. You have to embrace him as your Lord. Amen. Romans 10 9 says, if you confess with your mouth the Lord. Jesus. It means he gets preeminence above everyone else in your life. It means that you break up with all of your old boyfriends and girlfriends when you come to Jesus because you're giving him your life totally. You know, I was taken back here earlier this week on a video. I've seen it multiple times before. But I don't know, I don't know where you all go to, to to get rerouted at certain points in your life with God in the Scripture. But one of my go-to people that I can always go to besides our pastor to help me maintain the right course is John Bevere. Because I know that if I go to John Bevere, I will feel convicted if I'm doing the wrong thing. And I was watching one of his videos, and it was about his book called Killing Kryptonite. And in a video, he had his son sitting at a table with this girl, and they were eating dinner at this fancy restaurant. And what happens is, as they eat dinner, she goes to order her meal, and she orders, like, filet mignon and a sirloin and another meal. And he says, man, that's an awful lot of food. Are you feeding for, for more than one? And she says, yes, I am. And it turns out he thinks she's pregnant, but she's actually talking about her old boyfriends that slowly come and sit at the table with her and her husband. And as they're all sitting at the table, the husband's looking at her saying, who are these guys? Who are these people? She's, oh, that's my boyfriend. Oh, and that's my other boyfriend too. And she said, I love you more than all of my other boyfriends. You're my favorite by far. But he said, we're, we're married. And when you're married, you can't have any more boyfriends anymore. 
And it goes on through the story that she walks away mad and he's sitting there like puzzled. Why? And then John Bevere goes on to explain, we have a culture in the church that have embraced following Jesus without breaking up with their old boyfriend. We have a culture that is trying to follow Jesus without breaking up with their old sins. That's right. You can't serve God and another master. That's right. Your heart can't be divided between the two. And tonight I ask you, is God your husband and there's no one else? I'm talking spiritually. Is God the master and the ruler and the prince and the power of your life and there's no one else? Is he your source that you go to above all else? No exception. Because if he's not, he's not your Lord. Amen. If you hear the scripture and you do what's contrary to it with no conviction, Jesus is not your Lord. Right. He's not. Well, what about people that struggle with stuff? People do struggle with stuff. I'm not minimizing that. But what I'm saying is, if you have got to a place in your life where God's just a, a cog in the wheel and he's not the centerpiece, you're missing it. That's right. If you can come to a prayer meeting and have nothing to say, you're missing it. When I first got saved, I started coming to our Tuesday night prayer meeting. I was the youngest person here by probably 25, 30 years. And I learned that I didn't have to learn how to pray. I just had to have a heart to want to spend time with God. And when you have a heart to want to spend time with God, it doesn't matter whether you have words or not. You're just glad to be where He is. And Tonight, if, if we don't want to pray, if we don't want to hear the word, if we don't want to worship, what's wrong with us? What makes us any different than the lost world if we don't want to be with God? I can promise you this is not what I was going to preach, but I feel it so strongly for the body of Christ. It's time for Jesus to be the Lord again. Right. It's time for Jesus to be the Alpha and the Omega of your heart again. You can't live in sin and expect to have the blessing of God on your life. You can't live in disobedience to God continually. And expect God to show up mightily in your life. I guess what I'm trying to say tonight. 2 Chronicles 7 and 14 says that, that if you come to the Lord. Let's just turn there and read it. 2 Chronicles 7 and 14. Lord Jesus, would you speak to us tonight? It says in chapter 7, verse 14, If my people, that means those who hold my name, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. You're saying a child of God can have wicked ways? Absolutely. Then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. We're pursuing the healing of America, I believe, with a false repentance. We're pursuing seeing this nation being stronger with a repentance that is lip service to God, I believe. You know, the Bible says, Jesus said at one point, you people honor me with your lips, but your hearts are far from me. Far from me. You know what we should pray again? God, let sin break our hearts like it does yours. God, let our hearts burn for people that are lost like yours does. God, don't let us be comfortable following you at a distance. Because when you follow God at a distance, 
When a little girl in the marketplace says, do you know Jesus? You'll deny him because you're not bold in your faith because you follow at a distance. And if you follow at a distance, you're going to fall when the people that are close stay rooted and strong. Tonight, we are in a country and a system in this world that is so against God, and it's not just even subtly anymore. It's blatant, and it's in your face. If you love Jesus, you're wrong. We hate you if you love the Lord. And tonight, I command us and commission us by the Lord to walk in boldness. But to walk in boldness, you got to know that you're close to God. And to know that you're close to God means you have to have a heart that is sensitive to what God's heart is sensitive to. Amen. You see, the scripture in 1 John chapter 5 verse, verse 4 says, He that is born of God overcomes the world. And it says, and this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. So the only way I can overcome tonight is through my faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. The only, time, the only way I can overcome tonight is through my faith in the Word of God. So if I don't lean in hard and very focused and directed in my faith toward God, if anything jumps up that is difficult, that is hard, I'm going to back away from the Lord because my faith is not deeply rooted. You've got to have deep roots right now. If you don't have deep roots, you will be uprooted and you will be pushed aside. Tonight, I want to talk about th two things very briefly. Great faith versus little faith. Wouldn't you like to be somebody that when you leave this earth, when the preacher preaches at your funeral, he says, that was a man or a woman of great faith. They had great faith. That was a man of God. She was a woman of God. I want them to say that about me. And you do too. So we're looking at great faith versus little faith. Before I can talk about faith, I need to know what it is. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. It is the evidence of things not seen. I really like that word now because it means now, presently, now faith. You don't need a faith from the past. You don't need a faith that you had yesterday. You don't need faith for tomorrow even. You need a now faith that will work right now for you. That will work for you right in your present situation, right where you are. And that now faith is a faith that gives you substance. It says faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. I want you to understand that if you have now faith, it's like having a tree that has fruit on it and by your house. Let's just say you've got an apple tree right by your house. If you have now faith, faith that works in this moment, let's say you're hungry and you need some hope in the Lord. That now faith is like going to that tree and pulling an apple off of it and eating it. It's substance. Faith has substance. That means when you eat of faith, you get full. That means when you partake of faith, you're not as hungry as you were before. Faith can do things to you that will keep you full of God and not make you so hungry all the time. I need more of God's presence. No, you need to realize that God's presence is always with you, and then you'll learn to engage Him, and then you'll start filling Him again. Amen. You don't run around trying to find God's presence. He's right here within you. If you will engage him, he will come up and reveal himself to you. Amen. Jesus was talking to that woman at the well, and he said, if you'll get with me, you'll get well that lives on the inside of you. You won't have to always worry about getting buckets and drawing water. You'll have a well that springs up from within you. But that wellspring only works when you engage it and you realize it's there. What if I told you you really could go home and experience the presence of God in your own life? The Bible says in James 4 and 8, draw near to God.
and he will draw near to you. It's a promise that he's saying, if you feel empty, if you feel like God's far away, he's saying you're not drawing because I promise to always draw back when you draw near. He's saying I live inside of you, but you've got to engage me. And it takes faith to engage a God that you cannot see. It takes faith to engage a God that you cannot feel all the time. I don't know about you, but I've gone through seasons in my life where God feels like he is nowhere to be found. Am I any less saved? No. Does it mean I'm walking in disobedience to God? No. A lot of times when you're obeying God to your greatest capacity, you're like, God, why do you feel so far away from me? He's training you. He's pulling you closer. You see, God took the children of Israel through the desert before they got to their promised land so that they would know He is their promised land all the time. He's the one who provides manna. He's the one who provides everything they need. And if they forget God when they get to the promised land, they'll find that they might have a lot of food, but it's a very empty feeling. Nothing fills them up like it did with God with them. But let's look just real quick on Little faith versus great faith. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 25 through 34, I'm going to go ahead and read that. Talking about little faith. Matthew chapter 6, verse 25 through 34. It says, Is not life, let's see, therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat, what you shall drink, nor yet for your body, what you shall put on it. Is not life more than meat, and the body more than raiment? Behold how the fowls of the birds of the air, they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are not much better? Are you not much better than they are? Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit to his statue? And why take you thought for clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is cast in the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O oh, you of little faith? Does God ever come to you and say, O oh, you of little faith. He's saying don't worry about what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, what you're going to wear. That's what the Gentiles worry about. You worry about seeking me because I will provide it all. If you look in Matthew 8, 23 through 27, the disciples and Jesus have got into a boat and Jesus is laying in the bottom of the boat asleep and there's wind and there's waves that are trying to knock this boat off course. And the disciples are scared and they're afraid and they're panicking. And they say, Lord, save us. We're going to perish. And Jesus gets up out of his sleep and he says, oh, you of little faith. Why did you doubt? Is anyone in this room tonight in a boat that is swirling around? And God's message isn't, oh, it's going to be okay, Lord. Boy, a little girl, it's why are you so faithless? Sometimes God's saying, Come on, get up. It's not as bad as you think it is. Come on, get up. You're not as low as you think you are. Get up, let's walk together. Don't be of little faith. We see in Matthew 14 22 through 33, Jesus is in a, a actually, Jesus is not in the boat. That's the problem. Jesus is out of the boat, and the boat experiences some wind and some waves with the disciples. And they see some kind of person walking across the water, and they shout, It's a ghost! And then Peter says, Okay, if that's Jesus, let's, Jesus, you command me to come out on the water. We know he comes out, and he starts to sink as soon as he does what? He looks around at everything. I'm telling you, if you look around at everything right now in America, you will sink. You'll sink because there's so many distractions. Oh, there's another case of COVID-19. Oh, there's another case. Oh, they're going to shut down schools. There's all kinds of distractions. Oh, President Trump's losing in the poll. Biden's growing stronger. Oh, they want to take 
uh, funding away from the police officers. There's all kinds of stuff around us right now. And if you're looking at that, I bet you're sinking. Peter got his eyes off of Jesus and he started to sink. And when Jesus pulled him up, he said, why are you of such little faith? Oh, ye of little faith, why did you doubt? We look in Matthew 16, 5 through 12. Jesus is with his disciples and he says, beware of the leaving of the Pharisees. And his disciples start saying, oh, goodness, we forgot to bring bread with us. What are we going to eat? And he said, he probably looked at him and put his hand up. I'd like to slap you all right now. <laughs> he looks at his disciples and he's like, y'all are so forgetful. Don't you remember when I fed 5,000 people, 5,000 men with just a couple loaves and a few fish? Don't you remember when I fed the 7,000, how you, how you took up 12 basketfuls? He's saying, why are you all worried about what you're going to eat when I'm the one who can make manna rain down from heaven and bring bread to anyone who needs it? And he says, oh, ye of little faith. He said, why don't you remember? How did you forget? I tell you, little faith Christians are Christians that are easily forgetful. They forget what God has done for them. They forget how God is taking care of them. You know, there's some stuff that everybody in this room has gone through in the last probably two, three years that if you could really stop for a second and remember, you'd say, God took care of me mightily through that. But the problem with time is time causes you to forget. It doesn't matter how bad your situation might have been years ago. It doesn't feel as raw as it did those years ago. So the, the emotion and the pain of it isn't quite as strong as it was. And oftentimes, for many of us, we forget what it was like. And Jesus said, how could you forget? How are you so faithless? And then lastly, Matthew 17, verse 14 through 20. If, if you're writing these down, go back and read through all these. They're all about little faith. It is a man with his little son who is struggling. And his disciples try to cast out a demon out of this son. And the man says, Jesus, your disciples couldn't cast this demon out. Jesus goes and does what he does best. He casts the demon out, and then he goes and talks to his disciples. And he, they said to him, Jesus, how come we couldn't do that? It's because of your unbelief. Another translation says it's because of the littleness of your faith. Little faith. So we're looking at little faith, and now I'm going to look at great faith really quickly. So I'm going to go to Matthew chapter 8, and I'm going to read this. Matthew chapter 8, verse 5 through 13. This is the scriptures concerning the centurion. Matthew 8, 5 through 13. It says, And when Jesus was entered into Capernaum, there came unto him a centurion, beseeching him, and saying, Lord, my servant lies at home, sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. And Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. If Jesus said that to you, you would say, come on, let's go, Jesus. Come on, praise God, Jesus is coming to my house. But it says in verse 8, the centurion, the centurion answered and said, Lord, I'm not worthy that you should come under my roof. Speak the word only and my servant should be healed. You know, I find the greatest miracles happening in the Bible with people who honestly didn't think they were good enough to be in the presence of God. This centurion said, I'm not worthy, Jesus, that you should come to my house. I, I'm not. You're, you're on a whole another level for me. You're, you're way too holy for me. And I think the problem in modern Christianity is that Jesus isn't so holy that he's on a pedestal above us anymore. He's our friend and our buddy now. And he wants to be friends with you. Don't get me wrong. But he's your God before he's your friend. He's your God. He's on a pedestal. And you'll never, ever be able to live up to how perfect and brilliant and amazing he is. It doesn't mean you don't pursue Christ's likeness. But it means that you can be just like the Apostle Paul and be very close to God and say, You know, I was the wickedest of sinners. 
I was the chief of all sinners. How, how could he say that? Because he had had such an encounter with God that it humbled him to say, I need Jesus to save me every day. His perfection is greater than any kind of perfect I can even wrap my mind around in my own life. Your righteousness is filthy rags. Even today, even though you're more mature now than you've ever been, your righteousness is as filthy rags before Jesus. That's why we get up every morning and we say, praise God, Jesus, thank you for saving me. Because I hadn't forgot how ugly I was and even sometimes am. Do you all remember when you were lost? You all remember when, well, a lot of you weren't here, but I, I pretty much grew up in this church. I'd stand there with a scowl on my face and my arms crossed every single Sunday. Didn't want to have to hear, didn't want to hear anything any of you all had to say at all. Never in a million years would have thought God would have saved me and made me preach at this church. <laughs> you see... You were really lost before you got saved. You weren't that cool to be around. Yes, amen. Je Jesus did you a real service by saving you. Amen. Amen. You weren't that one that, you know, was really, really holy, and then you got saved and it just completed the puzzle. It, it wasn't like finding the match made in heaven. You were really ugly and, and nobody wanted you. But Jesus said, I want you. Yes, Some of you might have been drug addicts and alcoholics. Some of you might have been addicted to a lot of things. Some of you were just addicted to being mean. But Jesus came and he reached down in your dysfunction and in your ugly. I don't know about you, but before we got saved, he drew us over and over again. That's right, yes. Some of us got saved and then backslid years later. And what did Jesus do? He came running and got us back and dusted us off and cleaned us up. Man. If you'll be honest, you hadn't always been that pretty of a Christian, even when you were saved. I can think of moments in my life that I look back and I say, wow, God, why did you put up with me? Why have you been so merciful and kind to me? And then I remember the story of Saul and the story of David. And I think, you know, Lord, Saul lost his kingdom because he could not humble himself. He offered a sacrifice that only Samuel was allowed to offer. And he said, oh, I'm so sorry, God, I shouldn't have done that. But then he goes on to say, Samuel, will you honor me in front of all these people? Don't make me look bad in front of my, my people. You see... Saul did that, and he lost his kingdom. David killed a man, slept with a woman, and then his baby died. And God said, that's a man after my own heart. Who did the more wicked thing on the surface? David looked a lot more wicked in that moment than Saul did. But Saul was confronted with his sin, and he didn't really repent. David was confronted by Nathaniel the prophet, and what did he do? He repented, and he said, oh my goodness, I have sinned against God. You and you only have I sinned against God. What do you mean, David? You killed Uriah, and you stole his wife. How could you say, I've only sinned against God? Have you all ever thought about that? David was a man after God's own heart because he was a repentant man. One of the greatest words in the Bible is the word repent. Because that means that I could be doing it all wrong for 10, 20, 30, 40 years. But if I'll turn to God and ask Him to forgive me and repent of my sins and change and turn, God says, I'll forgive you right. and I'll treat you just like it never happened. That's right. And when you understand a God that forgives like that, it's supposed to make you say, God, I want to be close to you because you're so nice. And the Bible says the goodness of God leads you to repentance. 
It's because God has been so good to you that you repented. It's not because you figured it out one day. It's because you said, God, even with me not quite figuring it out, I can lean upon you, and you're always there. You're solid. You're steady. You're unmovable. You see, I started out preaching these things at the very start of the Scripture. If you love God, obey His commandments. And saying things like that, those Scriptures are true. And they'll point you to say, oh, Lord, please help me. If you can't get to the place where you're saying, God, forgive me and help me, you can't be helped. You're unhelpable. So one of the greatest things as a gift that God has given you is if you feel convicted when you do wrong, praise the Lord. That's a gift. If you feel bad when you say something mean to somebody, you need to say, praise the Lord. My heart's not hard yet. You're going to make mistakes, but you'll make a lot less mistakes if you'll keep your eyes on Jesus. You see, when Peter was shaking and sinking in the wind and the waves, if he would have took his attention from the waves and the wind and said, i got to get my eyes back on Jesus because I'm going to sink if I don't. If he would have turned his attention back to Jesus, he would have walked to Jesus. Would Jesus have said, oh, Peter, great is your faith? I doubt it. He would have said, there you go, Peter. How, how good a job did you do? You, you actually trusted me. Amen? Amen. 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 So we read about the centurion, and it says in verse 8, and the centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that you should come under my roof, but speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. For I am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. I say to this one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to them that followed, Verily I say to you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. This is a man who said, if God speaks the word, it is so, it is done. And he leaves it at that. So we see the centurion. We see another instance in Matthew 9, 1 through 8, where these people took the roof off of a house to get somebody to Jesus. We see in Matthew 9, 18 through 22, the woman with the issue of blood stretched her hand through the crowd and touched the hem of Jesus' garment. We see in Matthew 9, 27 through 31, that some blind men came unashamedly to Jesus and said, Lord, I pray that you would give me my sight back. And he healed them. We see in Matthew 15, 21 through 28, that this woman had a daughter who was vexed by the devil. And she came before Jesus and he said, it's not meat to give the children's bread to the dogs. And she said, even the dogs eat the crumbs from the table. And he said, oh woman, your faith is so great. So tonight in closing, I've got three quick points for you. What was the difference in great faith and little faith? Little faith is stopped by fear, while great faith is amplified by boldness. Little faith is stopped when fear comes, while great faith is amplified by boldness. Peter's fear caused him to sink, but the woman with the issue of blood, instead of pursuing fear, said, I'm crawling to touch Jesus whether I die in the process or not. Number two, little faith focuses on the material world, while great faith focuses on the spiritual world. Little faith focuses on material things and the material world, while great faith focuses on the spiritual world. God, I see you have a storehouse, and I'm tapping into what you have in heaven, not what's on this earth. Jesus told his disciples, don't worry about what you eat and what you drink. He was saying, don't worry about the material things of this earth. Seek ye first the kingdom and his righteousness. And last but not least, little faith makes decisions based on what is possible for humans. While great faith makes decisions based on what is possible with God. What is impossible for God tonight? Nothing. 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 I want 
want you all to stand with me tonight. We're going to close with Mark eleven twenty three. Lord, we ask you to help us to put our faith to work tonight. Lord, we ask you to give us faith that would move mountains tonight for our community. God, we ask you to create such a boldness for our faith that, Lord Jesus, we refuse to be silenced by the enemy. Now, if you know the scripture in Mark eleven twenty three 23 tonight, why don't you read it with me tonight? It says, For verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass. He shall have whatsoever he saith. So tonight I want you to say a few things with me in closing. I'm mighty in the Lord through Jesus. Say that with me. I am mighty in the Lord through Jesus. I have great faith. I have great faith. I have faith that moves mountains. I have faith that moves mountains. My faith overcomes the world. My faith overcomes the world. My faith makes the enemy flee. My faith makes the enemy flee. I believe that with God. I believe that with God. All things are possible. All things are possible. And I come today. I come today. And I declare over Mary. And I declare over Mary that the power of Jesus. That the power of Jesus shall rest in this town. Shall rest in this town. In this community. In this community. In the state of Virginia. In the state of Virginia. And the United States of America. And the United States of America. And I'm going to be the intercessor. And I'm going to be the intercessor for this country. This and I'm going to invite the Lord to do a mighty work here through me, through me. by my obedience, 